What's up, dude? You see that big guy trying to follow me up here? He kind of scared me. Hey, guys, how's everybody doing? Good, good, good. I want to welcome you to the XL. Tonight is the beginning of our series called Tattoo. Jonathan, thanks for coming out, buddy. Thanks for coming out. You got a little something hanging off your, you know. I ain't going to say nothing, but it's right there. Anyway, thank you very much for being here. A couple things you need to know. Up front is that the coffee bar is right here if you need something to drink. I think the, the commission's in there watching the last eight laps of the race, so if you need to finish that up real quick and then uh, come back in here. Uh, here's what I want you to know tonight, though. We're going to start, um, and we're going to hear someone's testimony in a few minutes. And when we, tell, when we give testimonies out here at XL, they are true. They are um, everything that you need to know about this person and, and how she can tell her story. But I want you to understand that my recommendation is if you have a first through sixth grader in the room tonight, they need to be upstairs in their ministry area where they uh, can be ministered to. Uh, preschoolers in their spot, first through sixth graders in their spot, because we will say some things, she will share some things in a minute, that you may not want to answer those questions just yet with your third grader or your fifth grader or whatever. So just letting you know right up front, so in the next few minutes you can make that transition happen, <clears throat> and uh, that would probably be best for you. So anyway, if you need something to drink, that's right there. Preschoolers down this hall and, and all that stuff be taken care of. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do tonight. We're starting the process of hearing of why God allows things to happen in your life so that you can have a story that he can use to grow his kingdom. Do you know, have you heard often enough here at XL that, that God is using you in different ways to grow his kingdom? Do you know that? No, one person. Thank you very much for appreciate you knowing that. Do you know that God uses the things that happen to you in your life to develop your story? And do you know that Scripture teaches us that God puts all things together, no matter what happens in you, He works them all together in certain ways to help you know that your story can be used for what God's got going for you. Some of the coolest things we got going right now is we're about to do Excel Gives Back. And we got an opportunity, we're, gonna, we're going to actually be able to, here's what's happening, we're not going to renovate someone's home, we're going to replace someone's home. Yeah, yeah, you should give it up for that. <laughs> and I want you to understand how cool that is, because not everybody just gets to replace someone's home all the time, but that's what God has provided for us. And one of the things I want to tell you that you have done, and I appreciate this about you, is that you came to Chili's last week. And we made almost 300 bucks. They gave us 300 bucks because you went and ate. So that's a beautiful thing. Give yourself a hand for that because I appreciate that. <laughs> but I want you to know that tonight, I want you to understand that to me, the whole purpose in, in many of you, many of you are uh, people that love to have tattoos and you got like hundreds of them on your bodies. All the freaks in the back. You know, the freaks come out at night. Hey, hey. Anyway, what I want you to understand is that each of those tattoos, for some of you, mean something. And you put them on your arm, and Big Daddy's got the tattoo of Jesus on his arm so that when he's riding his motorcycle down the road, people can see Jesus as he goes by. At the speed limit, right, Big Daddy? Perfectly going the speed limit at all times. But when you put a tattoo on your body, it tells a story. And the reason we're doing this series is because we want you to understand that every person in here has a story to tell. And the scripture that goes along with this and, and what we'll talk about and what she'll even share with you tonight, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Because you know what that means? That everything in your life, I know you're going to read it probably, everything in your life, God can use to develop your story. You know, I'm reminded of a guy named David out of the Bible that made some pretty huge mistakes in his life. And we still to this day read his story as a man after God's heart. I'm reminded of a guy named Paul who started his time in the Bible when we first began to see him as a guy that traveled all over the countryside killing Christians and ended up a person that wrote a huge chunk of the New Testament that we live out every day. And everything about him started with his story and allowed him to develop into the person that we look at and we follow every day now. 
and we follow his examples and his leadership every day. Every person in this room has a story to tell. And we're going to spend the next two weeks making sure you understand what that story is in you and making sure you understand how to tell that to other people. Tonight, we have an opportunity to hear Rachel Pinocchio's story. And I'm going to uh, pray for her in just a second, and then we're going to run one video. She's going to come up, and she's going to tell you her story. And my challenge to you is this. In every person in this room, I believe this tonight, God will use some part of her testimony to connect with you, no matter what. No matter if you've never been where she's been, no matter if you don't even understand some of the stuff she says, at some point in her testimony, he'll connect with you tonight. And that's the challenge for you to be looking for that and seeking him out so you know what he's telling you about your own story tonight. Let's pray together, and then I'll get out of the way and let Rachel begin to tell her story. God, we love you, and we worship you, and we honor you. And I pray tonight for Rachel, and I pray that you clarify her story in her own mind so that everything will be something that you can use to honor and glorify yourself and that you can, uh, God, you can help us develop the story in our own lives so that we can tell other people so that your kingdom ultimately can be grown. We love you, God, and we give her into your hands, and I give this night to you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> be honest with you uh that good lord these lights all right all right <laughs> you guys that that video right there that's what I want you to get out of everything tonight I'm going to tell you my story but I want you to understand out of my story what I believed was there what I perceived about what was going on in my life and how God changed my perception of all that, that I was, all that I had done, because of who I am in Him, and my relationship with the Creator of the universe. And that right there, that's exactly what some of you guys need tonight, is to examine your life as it is, and for you to allow God to flip it on you. And so you can stop believing the lies that Satan is putting inside of you, and that you've, you've taken hold of, and that's become all that you are, and you can't get out of it. And for God to be like, look, I climbed up on a cross for you. I'm telling you I love you. I'm telling you that I work all things together for your good. Your life is not the first part of that. It's the second part. Okay? So you can go ahead and put that first tattoo up there if you want to. Um, now, I wasn't nervous about speaking tonight until a couple of nights ago. No lie, okay? I had a dream about tonight. And, and gradually, about 20 seconds from now, if my dream comes true, this whole section right here is going to get up and leave. <laughs> and so, like, I thought about bringing some candy and throwing it from the stage so you guys would just stay here. And gradually, everybody would leave. And, okay, so hopefully my dream won't come true. All right, this is, this is a tattoo I've gotten recently, and it's, it's on my back. And it says, Soli Deo Gloria. And what that means in Latin is glory to God alone. And so that is, that is currently my motto for my life because there's been so much that's gone on. And I'm going to tell you my history. But the point of it is, is God gets all the glory, all of it. Because, and I'm not just saying that so like I sound all good and oh, she's giving God the glory for all she's done. No, God gets glory whether I think he is or not. Whether I believe he is or not. With what God is doing in my life and your life right now, he's trying to glorify himself. Because no matter what happens, whether good or bad, and I know, I know there's some tragic stuff that some people in this room have gone through. And I'm not trying to speak lightly of that at all, okay? So don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying to you is the truth, is that God is trying to glorify himself through no matter what it is that has happened to you, the good and the bad, okay? So where my story sort of starts is I was in church my entire life, I was the little five-year-old that got up on the stage in front of Western Baptist Church and said the books of the Bible, because my parents thought that'd be fun for everybody to see. And I grew up, and I was in church all the time, and in high school, I was super Christian. I was in all the Christian groups, had leadership positions. Um, I was president of pretty much everything you could be president of in high school. Um, didn't play any sports, because whatever. 
Um, but I was, you know, I was really, really smart. I, was, I am still smart. Okay. Um, I was valedictorian in my high school. I think when I graduated, my GPA was over 100, but they can't put 100 on your report card. And as I'm telling you this, I feel really arrogant telling you this, but the point is, all this stuff is, is things God has used, okay? So just understand that for me right now. Okay, and this is going to lead into my first verse. Philippians 3, 7 and 9. And this is something, in my valedictorian speech, okay, I got up and I told everybody that I hadn't done anything on my own. I had had help the entire time. And they all thought I was, like, admitting to cheating through everything. And you just heard this, you know. And then I read this verse. And it says, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Okay? And so that's what I believed at that time. I, I was very, my relationship with God was, was awesome. And that's what I wanted everybody to understand. And that's what I want you to understand tonight. And years have passed, but I'm back at the same point I was there. Just a lot more has happened that God's been able to use, and it's been awesome. Okay? Um, something else that, that was going on, I got accepted to the best college in the world, and that was Yale University. And if you don't know anything about Yale, because some people don't around here, they're like, why are you yelling at me? And... Anyway, it's fine. Whatever. I have it on my, my car tag, and people are like, Yale, 07, what'd you Yale at? But anyway. Um, okay, so Yale is an Ivy League school. Right now, their acceptance rate, I think, is around 9%. Really, really smart people go there. And somehow I got in. And I, I didn't remember, I don't remember ever praying about it. I prayed that I would get in. But after I got accepted, I just assumed it was the next step. Okay, so I went there. Now, why somebody that was homesick on every single church trip there ever was, and even had my parents, like, drive to South Carolina or something at one point to come pick me up, um, would choose to pick a college that was a 1,000 miles away? I don't know. But God's plan, okay? Um, so when we moved in, it was, it was just this awesome experience. Um, but a funny thing was there were strikers at the time. They were on strike. They were upset about... Um, not getting paid enough. And so I still remember, Dad, I'm sure you remember this, this guy coming up to you and yelling in the megaphone. What did he yell? You remember? Yeah, beep, beep, Yale is cheap. And my dad responded with, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and that's really funny. And the reason I just tell a joke to get my dad to talk is because my parents, through all this, were amazing and I put them through so much and and the part of that is recognize the people that are in your life right now because they're there for a reason and they're there they're there to minister to you and help you somehow okay but I digress so I moved in now when I when I graduated from high school I had never drank anything as far as I know nothing significant okay Never smoked a cigarette, you know, never, never had done any drugs, never had sex, okay? And I knew I was rare, and I prided myself on this. So maybe that was why God put me in a dorm room with an atheist, um, a, a wino, more or less, alcoholic, um, cool, cool people, but, you know, um, a devout Jewish girl, and, and a couple others. And after my first semester, I had gotten drunk, I had started smoking socially. Um, I had learned how to make a bong out of a Coke bottle. Um, Y'all shouldn't be laughing at that. This is church. Anyway, um, and, and I'd gotten into a relationship. I'd lost my virginity. I, I kept on, you know, just doing all these things. And I never, but see, the side of part of that is I joined the only Southern Baptist church in New Haven. Okay? I was in a small group Bible study. I was in a Christian a cappella singing group. And so I never, I never like, got away from my faith, so to speak. I never said, you know, whatever the heck with all that. It was all going on at the same time. And, and I wasn't trying to live a double life. I wasn't fooling myself. I knew I was sinning and, and whatever. And I just kept on and kept on. And that's when my depression started. 
Okay, depression is kind of what I'm going to be talking about a lot tonight. And so if you guys identify with that, great. And I hope, you know, my story can, can minister to you. Um, but that was what I remember as, as when my depression started. And I started on this journey of trying this medication, trying this. And, and, and throughout the years, throughout my entire college, what I would do is I would get, I would get in a relationship. I'd get away from God. I'd somehow justify being in that relationship, then justify getting out of that relationship going back to God and being, okay, God, you're all I need. Then I would get with somebody else because they would somehow convince me that, you know, God wanted me to be with them, and I believe that. And, and so we got this back and forth, and that went on for about four years through the whole college thing. And so I may forget throughout this to throw that in there, but just remember, at some point or another, I'm in a relationship, I'm going up and down, bouncing back and forth, okay? Um, but God, see, what God does is he always reminds you that he's around, somehow, okay? And my, the beginning of my junior year, I guess it was, it was September 16th. I don't remember lots of dates, but I remember this one. I was walking to my class, and I was wearing flip-flops, and it was a little cold, but whatever. It wasn't raining when I left my dorm room. It started raining, and I'm walking to class, and there's a lot of marble at Yale, because it's old and it's beautiful, but there is a lot of it. And I slipped on some marble stairs and landed quite hard. Um, was in the hospital for about three weeks. I couldn't walk for one week. And then I had this lovely little walker, and I had this cool cane that was all red and shiny that I took with me to class to get to class. And Yale is huge, okay? Um, so you walk everywhere. But me, I get to call the short bus. And I get before every class, I had to get up early, about 45 minutes early, because I had to call this bus 30 minutes ahead of time to be able to get to class. I had my pillows, these, you know, beanie pillow things, or like a donut-shaped thing, in, in one bag, and I had my books, my notebook, and I would go to class, okay? And I see some of you laughing out there, and it's okay, you can laugh. I laugh now. Um, I had a party, the year anniversary, and all that, anyway. Um, so while, while I'm in the hospital, and I had lost a lot of weight my freshman year, and, and kept it off. I was exercising. While I'm in there, I managed to gain all 45 pounds back thanks to pain pills, steroids, sitting around a lot, and partying with Ben and Jerry very frequently. And so I, you know, the depression was, was there. It was kind of transient throughout, you know, and, and the depression is back, and it's, it's strong. And it's like, okay, God, out of all the people, out of all the I don't know, there's 6,000 undergrad and graduate. Out of all those people, I got to be the one to slip on those stupid stairs and land in, in here, okay? I was mad at God, you know, whatever. While, while I was in there, I, I throw this in really short. There was a kid that was my age that had leukemia, and he was walking around. He was in bad shape. One of the nurses had told us he, he wasn't, didn't have long to live. One of my friends from my Christian singing group came to visit me, and I like to draw. I had markers there. I'm not very good at drawing, but it just made me feel better. So they were there. And so we decided we're going to write him a little card. Drew a picture. Okay, he was Korean. And, and we knew that there was a good chance he may not be a Christian. Because um, at Yale, there's lots of different faiths there. And um, we just put, God loves you. We're praying for you. And we gave it to him. And I'm still depressed. I'm like, okay, this is nice, whatever. But we did it. Now... When I got out of the hospital, about three weeks after that, I learned that that boy went to Korea and he passed away. Saw it in the school newspaper. Now, I don't know if he became a Christian. I'm not trying to say that to make the story sound better. But that was one of the things that through all the stuff I was going through, and I'm laid up in this bed, okay, doing that, the nurses told me when he got that card, he just cried and cried and cried because he hadn't had a lot of friends come see him, okay, and, and so God is going to use you. If you're in the middle of some kind of crap right now, God will use you, okay? You just got to watch out for it. All right. So, where am I at? I don't know. Junior year. Um, in a relationship, um, the reason I got out of that relationship was because God didn't want me to be in that relationship, and you won't go to church with me, and you don't think you should read your Bible or pray, and I'm not okay with that. Whereas I'm not reading my Bible, I'm not praying, I, I'm just, I know I'm supposed to do it, it's a thing you're supposed to do. But anyway, I got out of that relationship, and I start slowly turning back to God, and, and you know, come on, I, I can do it this time, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to 
do this, this, and this. And, uh, yeah, not, not so much. Um, the depression was, was still there. I don't really remember um, where I was as far as what kind of medication I was on. Tried a bunch of different things. Um, and, and just so you know, I'm not trying to, like, make a statement about antidepressants or whatever. Um, God uses all kinds of different things. But my problem, I don't believe it was chemical. My problem was I used to have a relationship with the creator of the universe, and he loves me, and I knew that, and I was ignoring him. And I was trying every other thing I could possibly try to fill that, go- that gap that God had put there for him to fill. There's a reason that you have this longing for something, and you can't really put your finger on it all the time, but you're trying different stuff, and it's still there. It's because God put it there just so he could fill it, not so you could put a bunch of other garbage in it, okay? Um, so at this point, you know, I, I, I'm still, still struggling with the depression. Um, I mean, it was just, I, I would cry and cry and cry and cry a little bit more. And um, I would think back, okay, God, you, you brought me through breaking my, my rear. You brought me through um, my schooling. As it happens, when I say God was always there, my grades just happened to be the highest that semester that I fell since any semester since I had been at Yale. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not me. Yes, you have a lot of time to study when your backside is all bruised up. You can't walk anywhere. But I didn't want to study, but somehow God was like, I'm still here. Would you please look at me? Okay? And God is, if, if you're in, like I said, if you're in some junk right now, God's doing that to you. I promise. I know he is because because he works differently with everybody, but he's got the same kind of methods. And if you pay attention, you can recognize it. So if you're in the middle of something right now, God is trying to get your attention somehow. There may be nothing good that you can possibly see in your life, but somehow God's showing up and he's trying to get your attention. Um, okay, the next verse, Isaiah 38, 17, um, says, Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. Um, this is what God says to you. And see, what I was doing, part of my depression was, I would, I would ask for forgiveness for all the stuff I had done, all the relationships I had screwed up in, you know, just, just a bunch of different stuff. I would ask for forgiveness for that, and then I would still bring it up. And I would, I would try to change it a little bit, because I know once God forgives you, he forgives you. And I knew that, so I was trying to, like, you know, use semantics to turn it into something else. And like, God, can you please take this out of my life? Can you please fix this? But this is what he says. He says that... All of, all of your sins are behind his back. And I feel like we kind of, we try to recycle our sins, okay? Like, you know how some, um, some toilet paper says, made from recycled products or, or different things like that, okay? That's kind of how we view our sins. We're like, oh, my sins are forgiven, but God can't really forget them, so they've got to be somewhere. And we're looking around, and we're like, oh, that's where they are. They're in the toilet paper, okay. I get it. Now I know where all the recycled stuff has gone. No, that's not, that's not how it works, okay? I don't really get how God can, can, you know, put it behind his back and yet not forget anything because he's God. That's complicated, but he, he does it, okay? That's all you need to know is he forgives you for real, and you got to forgive yourself, and I wasn't. I was still going through all this stuff, okay? And um, so I don't really know why everything sort of went down, but on October 28th, 2006, which is two days from now, be two years ago, was the first time I did something self-destructive. I got to the point where I was like, okay, I can't deal with this. And um, so about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was my best friend's birthday at, at school. It was, it was her birthday. I was supposed to go to a party. But about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I decided it'd be a, a good idea, not really a good idea, I just sort of did it, to take more than the appropriate amount of sleeping pills in, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm thinking, okay... I'm tired of trying to think all this stuff. I'm trying to figure this, you know, tired of trying to figure it out. I can't. I just want to sleep. If I sleep, then I can't be thinking about anything. So I'll, I'll just go to sleep, and, and that'll be fine, and, and I'll be okay. I wasn't really going to, you know, do enough to hurt myself. I just wanted some sleep, and that was how I justified it. Well, 
Good thing was, I left my door unlocked, and around 11.30 that night, since I didn't show up at the party, my friends came, and they shook me awake, and then uh, I had to explain what happened. And I wasn't secretive about what I was going through. Okay, I was in a great small group, and, and we were, a lot of us kind of suffered from some of the same things sometimes. And so I told them, I was like, yeah, this is, this is what I did. And um, I think they called my parents at, at some point, and the agreement was I would go and stay with my small group leader. She, she had already graduated, and she was on Campus Crusade staff. So I'd go stay with her, and at this point I'm like, okay, God, this was stupid, but now I'm going to turn to you, and now it'll be okay, and I'll work this out, and I'll... I'll go see another counselor, and, you know, I'll try some different kind of medication, and I'm really going to get with you, and I'm going to talk to, I'm going to meet with my small group leader, you know, one-on-one, and we're going to get this worked out, and I'm going to be okay. That worked for a little while. Um, I don't really remember the point at which I started cutting, okay? And this is the part where, yes, shock, and, and I'm okay talking about it now, um, but what I did is I would cut myself. And some of you guys have, have, may have heard of this before. And a lot of people don't really understand it. They're doing studies on it and all these kind of things, trying to figure out why people do this. But what I understand it as, the emotional pain was so bad that if I had a little bit of physical pain, it would make the emotional pain not seem so bad for a little while. Okay, so I, w- I would do that just a little bit, not enough to really, you know, do a whole lot of damage. Um, but that was what I, what I decided I would try to make me feel better. And to be quite honest with you, it did. Okay, I'm not going to lie, it did. Um, because we can, we can find things on our own that are going to make us feel better temporarily. There's no joke about that. Um, so I did it. I don't really know how many times I did it. It just sort of, when it came to mind, I would. Um, now at this point in my life, we're around Thanksgiving, Christmas time in 2006. Um, this is when I started smoking pot regularly. Um, I came home, and, 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 uh, and get this, too. I started another relationship when I got home. I found somebody that, that what they told me was, I accept you for who you are, and I know you better than anybody. And so, you know, we, we can do this, and we can work this out. And at the same time, you know, we're smoking pot together, and, and he's not a Christian, and okay. Um, and so... I'm pretty sure I I cut a couple of times when I was at home. And so I thought when I was at home, I was going to feel a little bit better because then if just in case it was homesickness that was causing my depression, that would go away. But I didn't. I was still miserable. And and at this point, I kind of quit trying to figure out where it was coming from. It was just there. And and I was like, whatever, you know. There would be times when I was afraid to drive because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to get myself from point A to point B. Now, I'm not really saying I was suicidal. I didn't care enough to be suicidal. I was just sort of ambivalent about life in general. I'm like, okay, God, if you're not going to make me feel better, then just whatever. Just take me out. Just do whatever. I'm just going to go along as it goes, and okay. Um, so that's what I kept doing. Now, I was still in school. Still had to manage that. In case you guys couldn't figure out, Yale is hard, um, and I could have studied probably a lot more. And it is by the grace of God that I ever got a diploma, okay? But it was still there. And I did it, and maybe it took my mind off of things. I don't know. Um, but now we're, you know, second semester of my senior year. My senior year. And senior year is not like high school. It's not easy. It's, it's much worse. Very hard. Um, and uh, so one, one night... You know, I don't even remember what, what happened, what point I was at, but uh, I just kind of decided to cut again. But this time it was a little bit more serious, and I kind of I cut more than what I had thought I would. I, I don't know. Um, and I freaked myself out. Because like I said, I wasn't suicidal. I just didn't really care. And... Um, so I did it, and, I, and I'm getting up, and I'm rushing to the bathroom, and I'm trying to clean it off, and I'm going back, and I'm in my room, and I'm just sitting there, I'm just kind of looking at my wrist, and um, I'm like, mm, mm-hmm, okay. And like I said, I was never secret about it. So I called one of the other girls in my small group, 
all of, you know, two minutes after it happened. And she came rushing over. And I didn't want to, I, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I'd stop talking at this point. Because what do you say? If you can even imagine this, which some of you can't, and that's fine, because it's my story. Okay? Um, I didn't know what to say. But somehow, when she was there, and she starts calling other, other people, other small group members, my friends, I'd somehow managed to, to get up, and at this point, I kind of, I moved over to my window, and I was sitting next to my window, and it, it's cold. It was January in Connecticut. Had the window open, and I was just sitting there, I was just smoking a cigarette. And uh, when my small group got there, and then an elder of my church and his wife, they got there, they basically just kind of moved me over to the middle of the floor, and uh, I just sat there, and they were gathered around me, and all they did was pray. They didn't ask why. They didn't ask what. They just prayed. And I didn't even think about this moment until recently that God was like, okay, this, this is what needs to go on. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me what. Just focus on me for once, okay? Um, so anyway, I, I'm trying to kind of rush this along a little bit so you guys can get it and you can put the next tattoo up there. Um, this one is one that I got that same year in, in, in my senior year when I came home. And it's, it's a trinity symbol. It's a symbol of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's, it's covering up a scar. You may be able to see it. I, I don't know. Um, and that's why I got it, because I was bound and determined I was not going to cut any more. And if I put that there to remind me of whose image I'm, I'm made in, and we'll get, that in, to, get to that in a second, okay? I, I wouldn't cut any more. Um, eventually, I ended up in a psychiatric hospital for a few days. And I didn't, I didn't get there voluntarily, really. Um, I was at the point where I didn't want to go. A psychiatrist decided that either you go or you have to leave Yale for good. And, and I was to the point where I was, I was packing a bag. I walked home in 20 degree weather, probably a couple of miles from his office to my dorm room, and my parents were there at this point. And um, I was packing a bag because I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into a hospital. I don't belong there. Okay, that's not where God wants me. I can do this. He can help me do this. God can help me fix this. Um, and, and, you know, my dad came back to my room and he said, you know, this is what he's wanting you to do. And these are your options. And I was, I was on the phone calling a cab to come pick me up, take me to the train station. I was going to go to New York City. It was an hour and a half away and get lost. And, um, but I ended up in the car because they, they were going to send a, a Yale cop to come get me. This was the point I was at. And I'm like, this is not me. This is not really happening. Okay, but it did. And um, so I decided I had to make this decision between this wonderful education that basically symbolized everything that God had done in my life just thus far. This, this thing that I was and this amazing opportunity that I had. That I, had. I had to choose between that and... <laughs> My pride, my dignity, my whatever was left of me at that point. And um, my dad was, we were, we were driving around, me and my mom, around New Haven. And the doctor was calling and was like, you know. And my dad, in his infinite finesse, once again, my parents just are amazing through all this, managed to not lie to the doctor and to not tell him that I was actually in the car with him at that point. And... Um, so at some point, through several, several expletives, I was like, screw it, I'll go. So um, I get there in the ER. They cut the string out of my favorite sweatshirt. You know, take that as you will. Um, and I ended up a total of five, five days in this place. And... Um, you know, I'm thinking there's one guy that's running and he's banging his head against the wall. There's another girl that's there and she's in restraints. And there's this other guy and he's sleeping like a vampire with his hands across his chest. I'm like, God, I do not belong here. Why <laughs> am I here? I don't belong here. But it's part of my story. And that's why I'm here 
telling you part of my story because there's somebody in here that needs to hear this. And I'm up here telling you that I spent five days in the nut house and God did something in my life and I'm here, okay? Now, that's the point that I've, you know, I can say that and some of y'all are like, I don't know how to act right now. Uh, she's telling this and, okay, do I laugh? <laughs> okay, for real, you can laugh because God is awesome and he's funny too. I'm convinced. Um, anyway, okay. In, in the, um, maybe you want to put the other tattoo back up. I don't know. Music has always been a part of my life. I play the piano. Um, ever since I was four years old, I think, was when I started piano, four or five. Um, there was a piano in the psych ward. I don't know why, but they had a piano. This old, you know, wasn't really that much in tune in the psych ward right outside of my room. And um, so that was probably the first thing I did that was healing at all, okay? I didn't really want to talk a whole lot. They were detoxing me from all the medication I had been put on, and it was a lot at that point. And, but I played. I sat there, and all I could remember was Amazing Grace and some set of chords that was probably from some song I played the piano for in the youth group, okay? And that's what I did, and I played it several times, and then there was this other girl that was like some classical master that would come along and play after me and whatever. When I got back, I played Amazing, Amazing Grace and my other song. And um, where I want to get to... Okay, and, and I know this is going to skip a lot, and, and just know I'll be glad to share this with anybody. If y'all got five hours one Saturday, you want to sit down, I'll tell you everything. Um, anyway, okay. Now, through all that, I had to stop applying to grad schools. I was applying to, like, Harvard and Johns Hopkins and Northwestern for some Ph.D. psychology programs because that's where I was going to go. I stopped all that. Now, I'm studying for a master's in counseling at a Christian university, and I'm able to do it online while I'm here and I'm working at a job. And see, the reason I tell you that is because God will take everything. And when Jared, Jared read Romans 8.28, and, and I got a bunch of other stuff, but that's the last one. You know, it's all things. It really is all things. And all things doesn't mean that we have to see them as good things. Okay, like I said, there's some really bad stuff that has happened to you guys. I know that. Okay? And it's part of your story. It's not part of my story. But there's somebody out there that needs your story. Okay? I mean, it, this is what I thought of. I, I'm going to use this example. I went to a flea market this weekend with, with a friend of mine, and uh, there was so much stuff. And I'm walking around and I'm thinking, how much stuff exactly is left over from the Civil War that people want? How many ways can you really dress a dog, okay? I mean, this, we're walking by, and this one lady says, is that for a dog or a baby? And I'm thinking, lady, if you got to ask, there's something wrong. But anyway, okay, those, a lot of those things didn't mean anything to me. I, I didn't, they weren't going to be treasures to me, but there are other things that were that I liked, okay, jewelry and stuff. You know, and that's, that's, each of us has a different story, and my story, for some of you, you guys may be sitting there and you're like, can we go yet? And there's others of you that are just like, like I was the first time I saw that video. And that's because everybody's story, no matter what is involved in it, God gave that to you because there's somebody else that needs it. And you need it, okay? Because he's done things for me based on my story that I never really thought, I mean, you know, there's people sitting in this room that are here because I went through all that mess and ended back up in, in Rome, Georgia, which I never said I would ever come back to Rome, Georgia, okay? This is why I say God is funny, all right? But when you get to the point where you can use your story and see where God is, is using you and how he's changing you, and I still struggle with depression sometimes and anxiety it's, it's still there occasionally, you know, it, and, and the reason for that, all I can say is it's another thing that's part of my story that God, that God is using. And, and I'm not trying to be all, you know, let's, let's talk about happy things and 
You know, it's painful. Yeah, what I went through was painful. I have scars to prove it. I have scars up here. I have to change the way I think about a lot of things. Okay? But God wants to use it. And, and if you're not a Christian tonight, okay, God is ready to totally flip your story upside down when you come to know him. He is the creator of the universe that wants a relationship with you and loves you and wants to do something with all the mess that you feel like is your life. If you are a Christian and you're struggling with some stuff, the first thing I'll say to you is check your relationship with God. If it's not where it should be, there's a good chance some of the stuff you're going through is because of that. That's not for everybody. Okay, when I say sin caused my depression, sin caused my depression. Okay, there's, there's different things, but that's just where I'm saying you, you need to start. Okay, now, if you feel like you're bored or you feel like your story really is not going to help anybody, my life's too boring or my life is, is too tragic or whatever, have y'all read the Bible recently? Okay, you got everything from somebody that's just on a list of somebody's descendants to thieves and murderers and all kinds of other freaks that God used. Now, that's, that's, that's y'all. That's who's sitting in this room. Wow, I just sounded really, really Southern. Okay. I'm back in Rome. Yes, thank you, Jesus. I'm here. Okay. But that's, that's what I want you guys to get out of this night. And I, I'm so excited that I'm up here because, you know, it was only a year ago when I finally stopped my cycle. When I got out of the last relationship that I had just jumped into for whatever reason, okay, was, was a year ago, today actually, when I'm, I got this person screaming at me on the phone, and I was just like, mm-mm, nobody yells at Rachel Pinocchio like that, and it stopped, and God was able to come in, I started my quiet times, oh my goodness, I did quiet times, and y'all know how to do those, because Craig told you, okay, and, and God just came in, and he started allowing me to see everything differently. He changed my perception of everything. It wasn't easy, but it, it happened, okay? And, and that's what I want you guys to know. You know, I, like I said, music is a big part of my life. Right now, there's so much more I could tell you, but I'm going to play a song. Mandy's going to come and sing. And if you're in the song, if there's anything <laughs> that I've said that hits a chord... Oh, wow. Hits a chord with you. Um, don't wait. There's people here. You've heard it. They have the silver tag. And um, they want to talk to you. They want to pray with you. They want to help you change your perception of what's going on. And I'll, I'll be around. I'll be around whenever, you know, a week from now, something hits and, and you need somebody, you know, I'll be there. And um, thank you guys for allowing me to share my story with you. Because this blesses me as much as it does some of you, I hope. No. Good job. We all think about Rachel. <laughs> you can clap for Mandy, too, if you just want to. There you go. Awesome. Uh, tell him I'll call him back. There's really not anything else I can say, Rach. I mean, it's, um, you pretty much laid it out there, and I appreciate who you are, and I appreciate it. You need to understand, that's the first time that Rachel has publicly told that story. And here's the deal. I know that some of you connected. Some of you connected with cutting that you'd never come in here and want to tell us about. Some of you connected with drugs. Some of you connected with just sheer loneliness and depression. Some of you connect with that story for all kinds of different reasons. And tonight is not really about, hey, let's tell Rachel's story and, and then make everybody think Rachel's really cool. Because Rachel is really cool. But you know why she's cool is because God has developed that story in her. And everything about her story today is because God works everything to the good of those that love him. And we want you to understand that you have a story too. And for all of those times that you've thought, all those times in your life that you've thought, man, I've messed up too bad, God could never use me. Man, I've done so much stuff wrong, it will never be where God can do anything through me. You need to understand tonight 
that every place you've ever been and everything you've ever done and every mistake you've ever made and every great thing you've ever done, God will use as part of your story. And I can tell you that the reason that I do the things the way I do them today is because of where I've been all my life. And the things that you do in your life today are because of where you've been throughout your life. All of that is part of your story. I'm going to ask the band to come back up and close out with one more song tonight. But you need to understand that when you get up in the mornings and you begin to seek God for who He is and you begin to seek Him for, hey, God, what do you want me to do in this life? He is helping you write your story every day. And He's writing your story in a way that will grow His kingdom ultimately. Because let me tell you this, and she, she covered a little bit of this, God's not making your story interesting so that people will listen to you one day. He's making your story interesting so people will listen to you tell them about how He made your story interesting. Because it's not about your story, it's about God's glory through your life and your testimony. And we'll talk more about next week, what is your story? And we'll hear more testimonies and we'll see more things happen and we'll walk through the process of how that story comes about in our lives. And my challenge to you every day, number one, this week, pray for Rachel. Because what you see at XL and what you see in our lives is when people stand up here and tell their story, the enemy doesn't like that much. Pray for her protection this week. Number two, you, you relate and figure out what part of that story tonight God put in there for you. And then three, just allow him to write his own story in your life this week. And we'll talk more about that next week as he comes as we come and, and talk through that, how he develops that story. Tonight, they're going to close with one song, and you'll understand it, but it just basically says some of your stories are still being written. And as God develops those, we're going to see God change his, his kingdom because of the stories in your life. You know.